Thanks for tuning in to another edition of Rockland Sounds, where Rockland turns into Rockland. I am your host, Tom Osa, and I'm here with my great friend and host, Mike Doherty. And Mike is uh, tuning in from Austin, Texas, as always. Uh, Mike's, uh, Mike's area is uh, one of the music centers of the United States. Proud to have you on, Mike. Thanks for being here, as always. My pleasure. Um, yes, we are known as the music capital of the world, but uh, we're just the capital of the world at some point right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but we'll get back to to music capital hopefully very soon. You know. Yes. All right. Well, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest for tonight. We have Greg D'Angelo uh, of many different fame uh, as a drummer for many different awesome bands that you know and love. Uh, early on, uh, and you're going to know these names: Anthrax, uh, one of the big four, uh, in the early '80s; White Lion. Some great hits from White Lion. And there's also a, a plethora of other projects. I got the chance to talk with Gregory a little bit before our interview today. And uh, he has definitely been keeping busy, uh, not just during the last nine months of what we've been dealing with, uh, but over uh, many years. He's got a few projects going on, and uh, we'll be talking a lot with them. So, Greg, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, guys. It's my pleasure. Yeah, thank you for me, too. Um, yeah. Well, I'll start because um, I have probably more of a, I'm a little older than Tom, so I have a little bit more of the uh, experience in the 80s of going to concerts and stuff. So you would be the second guest um, on our podcast. One would be Todd Holworth, where I went and saw you guys at the Beacon Theater. Sure. So you, it was you guys, Y&T, and, uh, and uh, Freely's Comet. And uh, that was an amazing show. I think it was right before your uh, Pride album came out, if yeah. I remember. Like, yeah, wait, was hitting in the radio at the time. Yeah. Well, what was that, the fall of 87? Uh, yeah, uh, like September in, in 87. Yeah. yeah, a couple of weeks before there, early. Yeah, that was a big night for us. Yeah, no, it was a, a fantastic show. Every single band was not like at the top of their 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 game at that you know that uh, night. So yeah. it's something that is stuck into uh, in the into my memory seared. And then um, I, I saw you again. Um, I've seen you as you know as a musician a few times, but uh, I saw you again um, open up for Ozzy. Yes, uh, uh, on the uh, No Rest for the Wicked. I believe so. Yeah, at the, at the Meadowlands. I'm in a I'm in the, at Austin, Texas, but I'm from New Jersey. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I have another story. Now you're, now are you at a drummer that's on Fight to Survive? Cause as I, I was not. doing. No, okay. That record was recorded before I joined the band. Right. So I was looking that up and I just wanted to clarify that cause you can't yeah. always trust me. Um, and uh, so I had a, in a high school, this crazy guy who's like loved music and uh, he, he, he was one of those guys that like was in um it maybe in high school and he was still and he was probably like 21 <laughs> uh -huh. they're way too late and uh he opened he would open up his uh, locker and he just had cassettes from all these local bands in there yeah. and i bought fight to survive off of them for like four oh, bucks really healed and everything it was perfect you know and wow. i took it home and i was i was hooked on that album and then i became a fan of, of the band since then um, another amazing show. I think you were there because I remember uh, quite clearly remembering your name um, was um, Twisted Sister at the Starland Ballroom. Oh, and with Steve and Chrissy. Uh, I vaguely yeah. remember that. And uh, that was an interesting show because uh, yeah. Stephen was definitely exactly the way I wanted to watch him. Like he was like the 80s never stopped. Yeah. And, uh, had a nice little buzz going and running around singing all the hits and it was great. And then yeah. Twisted Sister almost took that place down. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, we were in our forties at the time, forties at the time. And we went, both went back, my wife and I went back to being about 15. So that was an amazing show. So again, thank you for being here. And, um, do you have uh, anything to, uh, to uh, add in there, Tom? Yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, as I mentioned before with Greg, you know, I'm, a, I'm also a drummer. So I, uh, All right. Some of your drumming style, and uh, just very impressed with, uh, let's say, uh, how you hit the sticks. And uh, <laughs> Thank I, uh, you. I'll uh, defer, of course, to Mike, but I might ask you some questions about how you picked up certain styles over the years. Your technique. Sure. Very interesting. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. 
But yeah, Greg, uh, Mike, uh, back to you. Um, well, I mean, after the White Lion thing, because I remember at one point, I think I saw some uh, 80s uh, concert and you were no longer in the band. I don't think James was there either, right? James so, and I, yeah, we left at the same time. Okay, so what was that? Was that just in your normal band differences or money differences or? Yeah, it was, you know, I mean, it's it's a, uh, it's an old story, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not uh, trying to get into gossip. I'm just asking what, what made you go move on, that's all. Well, you know, it, it was it was a lot of things. You know, I think the band had kind of run its course at that point and uh, we were a little burnt out. Mm -hmm. uh, James, James and I had, had started playing with Zach Wild. Um, yeah. Um, a few years before and had been playing with him while we were playing in White Lion. And okay. um, we had uh, uh, this band that I think you mentioned called Leonard Skinhead that used to play mm -hmm. around the country, really. We uh, used to do some flyouts and we played a lot in Los Angeles. And that morphed into uh, Pride and Glory. Mm -hmm. and, Great band. Um, and I left just prior to that record being recorded, about a week prior. Wow. Okay. Now Zach is another local guy. He's from yeah. uh, from the Jackson where Great Adventure is, Tom. Okay, uh, on the shore. So uh, another local guy makes it makes it big, um, and still doing well. Um, now moving on. I mean, uh, to be honest, it's really I think you should maybe dictate a little bit. One of the things we do is um, we we do ask everybody what your influences uh, were and what was the first album you ever bought with your own money. Now, everybody's going to get sick of hearing me and Tom because we tell the same story every week. Well, but, um, you know, it's only a, only a minute long, so we can do it. Okay. <laughs> well, the first record the first record I bought with my own money, I think, was Black Sabbath Paranoid. Mm. But the first record I, I got was Abbey Road. My dad bought me Abbey Road when I was uh, about 20 years old. Yeah, that, that's probably my favorite Beatles album, Abbey Road. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mine was Queen the Game. Oh, saved, wow. Saved up my lunch money because I used to go to, uh, and I'm dropping this just for people that may know us. I used to go roller skating at the Livingston Roller Rink. Uh -huh. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, they had like the hot hit hour, you know. So yeah. another one bites the dust hit, hit the top there. And, uh, you know, we were all roller skating to it. And uh, I, I got the single. I think my mother actually brought it home and gave it to me and then uh i was able to uh go out and just save my little 250 for a couple of days for lunch and uh and ran up the street on a saturday and bought it and amazing uh, band one of my favorite bands i love queen yeah me too and uh i got to see them with paul rogers yeah. um and that was you know it's different but but still got the queen there was queen there enough queen for me yeah uh, so and to, Greg, and you to make me happy Abbey Road. So I think that's the second of, you know, and again, this is our fifth podcast. I think that's the second person on this podcast that mentioned a Beatles album was one of their first. So wow, you know, really? Yeah, those roots run deep, I think. So I think it's actually the third guest. It was three? Todd, Todd, Audie, and they all said something about the Beatles. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Todd did as well. Todd Hallworth, yeah. And then so, Tom always has a little uh, fun, uh, fun little memory about how he uh, bought his first album and why <laughs> yeah well i was on the low end of the totem pole in uh, grammar school and uh you know one of my friends basically came up to me and he's like yo dude do you like metallica i was like yeah yeah i, I like metallica and he walked away and i was like now i gotta find out who metallica is <laughs> <laughs> master of puppets and i was like whoa oh, yeah. that's a great record too yeah so the the, the pride and, the pride and glory came out um well i'm skipping ahead because i did ask your influences so go sure. start there again okay yeah sorry and you uh, oh influences. did you pick up the music and uh, you know you kind of like uh feel through that first did you or did you start playing instruments along with that or how, how did that uh mix play out i i probably uh have memories of wanting to play the drums prior to buying any music um you know, I grew up in New York City listening to AM radio, mm -hmm. um, and you know they were playing great music. A lot of a lot of like Chic. I remember hearing Chic, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on WABC in New York, and um, Niles you know, Rogers. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, the early disco that was really musically quite well done. Um, you know, and listening to bands like Brownsville Station, 
uh, Grand Funk Railroad, um, them, man. and you know, and whatever was really on the uh, top forty, you know, and there was a lot of really cool top forty music back then. Um, mm -hmm. So I was, you know, I, my earliest memories are pulling the pots and pans out of my mom's um, <laughs> cupboards, like I'm sure you know me and a million other drummers. Um, I'm not even a drummer, and I did it. Yeah. So, you know, I, that graduated to me duct taping a, a manila folder on top of a garbage can and breaking through it in two seconds. And eventually I got, uh, you know, a used set of drums and, you know, uh, worked on those for a while, bought a used piece here, used piece there, um, saved up some money and I got a, uh, a pearl set from Sam Goody that was the same color as Peter Chris's. And uh, that was my first pro kit. And I used that um, pretty much, you know, through all my formative years, through all my studying years until, uh, you know, we had a big snowstorm and I was able to save up some money from shoveling snow. And uh, I bought a sonar kit, which was a gigantic step. You know, Ringo was a big influence, obviously. Um, um, you know, uh, all the 70s English guys, um, I, you know, John Bonham, like every other drummer, you know, I just absolutely love John Bonham. He's probably, he's my favorite drummer. Um, but also uh, right up there is Cozy Powell and um, Simon Kirk from Bad Company. It's a big influence. I love the way he plays. Um, Tommy Aldridge, mm -hmm. uh, Vinnie, Vinnie Caliuta. Um, I know I'm leaving out so many. Buddy Rich, um, Tony, William, Tony Williams. Um, you know, these are the guys that just kind of, you know, pop it, pop into my mind. Um, these are the guys that I'll still listen to today when I'm looking for some inspiration. You know, I could listen to to uh, Trampled Underfoot a thousand times and I'll, I'll always hear new stuff. And I'll just kind of like, you know, kind of think about, you know, how he was sitting when he was playing that. And, you know, you just kind of, Put yourself in that position and, you know, with and, yeah, and see, like, what, what is he hearing? How is he reacting to what he's hearing? You know, how is, how is the music that he's hearing inspiring him to play what he's playing? You know, and it's, it's got a lot to do with, you know, just not just playing the beat, but how you physically hold yourself and a lot of different things. You know, how he's answering the lyrics. That's always a big thing for me, you know, with drummers is, you know, how are they filling in the spaces and how are they leaving the spaces? Yeah, the negative space is uh, it's something that I guess over the course of time it starts to become more prevalent in the you know the the empty notes almost become as powerful as the the filled notes. I I believe that very much so. Yeah, I can tell you you know I, I've been playing music. I'm a songwriter singer, as well. Me and Tom uh, played together. Yep. Uh, uh, we uh, we multiply. Uh, Tried to kill him on a few occasions uh, accidentally, but, you know, he survived. Um, <laughs> but I noticed that, you know, there's a lot of things that I like playing. I like writing songs with the drummer, okay? Mm -hmm. And because one of the things is, you know, and this happened with recently with a friend of mine, and uh, we just got together, have a couple of drinks and, and jam. And, um, you know, you could drop a stick in the middle of a verse, you know, and the verse could be going, you know, going along chugging. And now you're got to get that you're, you're getting another stick and you slow it down for a second. And if you listen to it back, you're like, wait, we just went to a whole complete different place of the, you know, of a song. And it made the song that much better from the screw up. Yeah. You know, so that's that's something that's special, you know, when you're when you're playing with people, that interaction. You know, there's so many people that rely on just like the computer or, you know, not that those aren't great tools. I use them at home. But, um, you know, just little screw ups like that. You know, I've had things where. I hit the wrong note because somebody walked in a room and I'm working on a song and oop, wrong key, you know, wrong key. And wait, that works. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's, I noticed too um, in looking up uh, for you and, and these obviously aren't bands as, well that are as known, but um, a local thing was you played with the band cities. Yes. And they, yes. that they were a great band. I remember because it yeah. triggered me to remember that. And uh, anything want to say about that? And I know you played with Burning Star, I think, right? Uh, I did a record for Jack for for uh, Jack Star, yeah. Jack Star. Um, never never played live with them, um, but uh, Cities was a great band. They had a great guitar player uh, named Steve Moranovich, um, and I, I think I primarily joined the band because I wanted to play with him. 
Okay. Um, great player, uh, really great guy. Um, and I um, actually, I left Anthrax to join that band. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, you were part of Fistful of Metal. Uh, for one of the tracks, uh, there was, um, and I wasn't able to figure out which one from uh, from Wikipedia, and I apologize. Which which were you uh, showcased on Fistful of Metal? You know, I've been told that, and believe it or not, I've never spent the time to figure it out. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure, you know, uh, if I'm on that or not, or or I, you know, I think I read some place where I was on one of the singles or something like that. I I I never really investigated it. Um, um, not for any reason to do it or not to do it. I just kind of, you know, just haven't done it. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but uh, you know, those uh, I had a great time playing with those guys. They were wonderful guys. Scott Scott was a wonderful guy and uh, a good friend. And, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, that was uh, we were we were young guys. We were like 17 years old, 16, 17 years old when I was in that band. But uh, a lot of monumental moments. We were, you know, basically outside the door when uh, they threw um, Dave out of uh, Metallica because Metallica had. Oh, the, oh, had the oh you were the there. Bar. Yeah, we were there. Um, That's a warehouse or something. You guys were all hanging in, or a yeah, studio. And there was there was a, a building in Jamaica Queens called the Music Building, and okay. uh, Scott and Danny and I used to make these pilgrimages out to Old Bridge, New Jersey, to go to Johnny Z's. Um, uh, record shop, which yeah. was in a um, a uh, indoor mall, kind of like a, a um, what do you call those things? I forgot what you call them, but like a like uh, a strip mall. Not a strip mall. It was like they set up on the weekends. It was like a, uh, a flea oh, market, like a flea kind of, market, yeah. something like something like that. And Johnny had a booth, and he used to, you know, he had he had his finger on the pulse, and he had all these imports, you know, that bands that we had never heard of. You know, y and T. We had never heard of y and T, even mm -hmm. though they were on, you know, a big label and Raven and Diamond Head and uh, mm -hmm. you know all these bands. I was like, oh, who's this? And um, like the, the vinyl. Just, we just took a deep dive. We loved all that stuff, and we dove deep into it. Uh, it was a French band called Warning. They were a great band. Um, but uh, you know, we would. But Johnny would put on shows. We would sneak into the shows and. There's still pictures of us, you know, standing backstage, and he's like, "How the hell do you guys get backstage?" You know, at 16, 17 years old at these at these shows. Um, but uh, you know, we were trying to talk him into doing a label and to helping us out and bringing us on. And he told us about Metallica. He says, "I just signed this band called Metallica." I said, oh, "That's really cool." He goes, "Yeah, wait till you guys hear Metallica." And sure enough, they were uh, amazing. You know, um, so we helped him out. Or we helped, you know, John out by hooking him up with the guy that um, was actually managing Anthrax at the time, who ran the music building, and he was able to get Metallica a um, was uh, it, a room. Was that David Krebs? No, it wasn't David Krebs. Oh, okay, it wasn't David the, Krebs. It was a guy. The reason that, the reason I ask is the last interview we had was a two hour, almost a two hour interview with Lips from Anvil. Oh yeah, and he goes right into the same thing. You know, Johnny Z, and I've known him forty years, and almost right, pretty much in that same line of what you were talking about, yeah. Megan Force, and you know. So it's funny. Well, I, know how, Dave, I know David Krebs. I see David all the time. David's a friend of mine. He, he wasn't was, too happy you know, with him, but uh, nothing but much, nothing <laughs> but good things to say about David Krebs. Um, <laughs> but um, I don't, and I don't know what Lip said, but. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, so, so yes. Yeah, so they got the room in the music building and uh, we socialized, you know, they had nothing, you know, uh, there were, there was a couple of times where I think Scott brought James back to his house to grab a shower. I know Dave came to my house, to my mom's house and, and Cliff came to my mom's house nice. and um, oh, Cliff, you know, and uh, it was, uh, if we, if we had any idea that, those times were going to turn into the legends that they are now. I would have taken better notes or more photos. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. You know, and it's funny that you mentioned that. And one of my favorite movies is Stand by Me, the original. Uh -huh. uh, you know, Will Wheaton and River Phoenix and everything. And I love what Richard Dreyfus says at the very end. He says, you know, I never had any friends. You know, obviously 12, 15, 18. He said, I never had any friends. Uh, like I did when I was 12. And he's like, my God, does anybody? Because like, you know, we grow up with these people and it's, it just become ingrained in our, uh, you know, minds and hearts, I think. 
So yeah, it was it was really kind of like the last moment of not really having any responsibility, you know, in that band. You know, from from then on, from from between Anthrax and Cities forward, it became work. And it became responsibility. Not that it wasn't a good time, but there was a lot. It was a lot heavier. It was definitely a lot heavier. Anthrax was, you know, we were we were still really kids. We were kids. Yeah. And the music industry, I mean, you know, just from from us looking out, I mean, it could eat a person up, you know, for in multiple ways, you know, management of uh, time, management of money, management of self, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it could be a vicious cycle where it's just like, you know, people can get strong out. It looks like you've done, uh, you've uh, kind of like uh, kept yourself uh, well organized and busy over the years. You mentioned, uh, you know, a few projects that you've been working on uh, throughout the last nine months. I uh, I wanted to hop into uh, I guess your uh, your years with Anthrax and then uh, you migrated out around the uh, the mid '80s around '83 and then uh, and then there was a connection with uh, another band that ultimately became White Line. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I I was uh, I had been playing with a band that band Cities for a while. I left that band and there was about I don't know probably a little bit less than a year. Um, where I wasn't affiliated with any one particular band, um, just playing a lot uh, around New York City. Um, but through my time with Cities, we used to play Lamore in Brooklyn a lot. And uh, you know, I got to meet uh, the Parente brothers who owned the club and who were managing White Lion, unbeknownst to me at that point. Um, but um, I, I think I was at a baseball game, a Met game with Bruno Lavelle. And I think uh, he told me about this band White Lion that was looking for a drummer. And uh, and oddly enough, I was looking at the Village Voice uh, around that time, and there was an ad. I still have the ad someplace um, that they had placed because they were looking for a drummer. And I think they had seen everybody in New York. I think they told me they played with, with about 600 drummers or something like that, some ridiculous number. And I think I was one of the last guys in and played and it worked and uh you know and uh the rest is uh rock and roll history as they say like, yeah cool. that's it you know <laughs> very cool yeah. obviously uh some uh mainstream hits that uh will withstand the test of time you know even with the change in music and how uh you know we've kind of switched to kind of like digital and such but uh certainly some things that are going to withstand the test of time possibly for centuries in my opinion wow that would be awesome i mean uh who knows um white lion worked really hard it was a job we rehearsed every day we were at lamore in the basement of lamore rehearsing every day and we would go out every three months and we would do this um three three to four months something like that and we would do this uh little route between boston and, and washington dc and we would hit the same clubs and we just tried to build up a little bit of a following around that circle. And, um, you know, with, uh, other, other things that were happening within the business of the band, uh, the, uh, Japanese import coming in, getting picked up by, uh, by an independent here and, and selling very well. Um, it worked and, you know, we got, we got a little bit of attention enough to get us a major deal. Nice. Yeah. I'll bet Electra uh, was kind of kicking themselves uh, early on because uh, Fight to Survive, you originally uh, were supposed to release it under Electra, and Electra decided to uh, step back from that. And I think you ended up uh, with Victor Company. We ended up on yeah, it, that was it was a li that's a little bit before my time in the band, but from what I know. Um, um, the band did get a deal with Electra. Electra decided to shelve the record. They weren't going to release it. Um, but um, luckily, uh, the band got a separate deal in the Japanese territory on Victor Records. And that, re that record did come out and did very well. And mm -hmm. it started coming over as an import. And it did very well as an import. And uh, we tried to buy the Fight to Survive record as a band, so we could put it out. Yeah. And uh, we couldn't. We couldn't come to terms for whatever reason. But there was a guy out of uh, out of uh, I think he was out of Philadelphia, Grand Slam Records. Uh, I think his name yeah. is Brian McAvoy. 
and uh, somehow he got a lecture to sell him the record. He mm -hmm. released it. It did phenomenally well. And ultimately, you know, the attention that that record got as an independent, like I said, helped us get a major deal. Mm -hmm. And that was with Atlantic Records, I believe, yeah. 87. And uh, then Pride came out. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, and then you mentioned that uh, while we were talking about uh, Free Lease Common, you guys uh, toured with them. And uh, yeah, that was our first um, tour, multiple dates in a row. I think we did three or four weeks. Um, well, was it? I think it was. Yeah. And um, and then we went out with Kiss for uh, you know in the fall of that year. And uh, nice. And that was arenas. That was the first time we were in arenas, you know, steadily. Um, yeah, it was, it was great. Crazy yeah. Nights tour? Was that 87 in the Crazy, crazy Nights? Yeah, yes. Crazy Nights tour. Okay. Yeah, that was a great show. I'm just going, I just uh, been going through some stuff. Out of some old, uh, you know, since I have so much time because of this virus. Yeah. Kind of like cleaning up little things and I'm finding finding stuff from different uh, from tours. Here's a, uh, on our second record, we uh, toured, with, toured with Cinderella. There's a Cinderella backstage pass. Oh, cool. oh, that's great. I had, some, I had some Kiss ones. I don't know where they went off to. You have a, a favorite White Lion album of you, that you were on? A favorite White Lion? Album that you just ate. What's your favorite White Lion album? Album? Yeah. Um, I don't really have a favorite album, you know. Um, there's there's good about you know um, about each of them. There's there's high points for each of them, really. Um, I always thought that you guys were very consistent compared to some of the bands from that era. Yeah, I you know I, I think the one thing that I wish we could have had is a little bit more time before we let out big game. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there's a lot of great moments on that record, and I think if we would have had a little bit more time to prepare. Um, it could have been, you know, maybe a little bit more. I, I like the album though. I listened to it not too long ago because of uh, knowing we were going to speak with you. So I've mm -hmm. gone through the catalog recently. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, there's some songs that snuck up on me that I was like, I didn't like that as much back then. You know, I mean, it's always in my playlist and stuff. And we listen to Sirius XM out on our deck grilling and stuff. So I'm always hearing your songs, but they're always playing the majority of the songs they're playing are the ones that you know. Right. And I'm a fan of going into the deep cuts on albums. That's me. Right. And um, like something like Love Don't Come Easy off of Main Attraction. Right. I was like, that's like a, you know, right in that, that would have been a hit, like a Journey song, you know, it's like perfect in that sense. If you had the right maybe push for a song yeah. like that. Yeah. And that was like, right. No, I'm not trying. <laughs> Don't make me feel bad. I'm, I'm complimenting you. <laughs> no, no, I, uh, I appreciate it. I, uh, you know, um, you played on I a thought, great, that great song. So I thought that was a great record. I thought we performed really well. I thought the material, uh, yeah. was strong. Um, tides were changing mm -hmm. you know, yeah, know. and, uh, every, you know, a lot of times it's about the new. That's right. And you know, the, 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 the ocean comes in, the tide goes in, tide goes out, tide comes yeah. in, but you know what? For some but people that made a lot of fun of what they call hair metal, uh -huh. okay, it is holding on its own pretty much. You know, it, it's it's not dying. It seems you know, like there's, a, there's definitely a loyal following out there. I mean, uh, I you know over the past few years, um, I was playing with Stephen Piercy from Rat, yeah. and uh, we saw a very very healthy uh, community mm -hmm. of people that wanted to see that music. You know. And we're still relatively young. And you know what? We, the way I grew up, I actually, and I have six kids. So I inherited five stepkids from eight to 18 when I met my wife. And wow. I had an eight-year-old. Now they're all grown. But yeah. you know what? My my daughter, when she turned 16, we got her Billy Joel tickets at the garden. Oh, and you weeped. And you would think it would be, you know, somebody like Britney Spears. Yeah. No, it was Billy Joel because that's the house she grew up in. Yeah. Listening to all the, that type of music we listened to. So, you know, it's still going and, you know, every show I go to, there's kids there, you know, wow. and as long as the kids are there, you got another generation of, of the, that music staying alive. Yeah. So I oh, think that, great uh, songs. 
Yeah, that's it. That's some of the best songs ever written, right? And that's the end of the. That's the end of it. At the you know, that's the story. Yeah. A good song's gonna hang around. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I do without bringing anything down. I did scroll through your Facebook page because we're friends okay. on Facebook, and I did notice two things. Okay. Um, one, we lost Eddie Van Halen, and yes. you knew him. Uh, I I was lucky enough to spend some time with him. Okay, and then Frankie Benali as well. Yeah, Frankie was a good friend. Okay, so without you know, we don't want to bring the bring it down. But if you you have something special, maybe that you could share um, about either one. Wow, I mean, they're both such special people. I mean, uh, you know, I love Frankie. He was a great drummer, great guy. Um, got to tour with Quiet Riot with Quiet Riot um, in Mexico a few years ago, and uh, you know, him and I laughed together quite a bit. Um, I loved how he played the drums. I think he liked how I played, and um, you know, we were always happy to see each other. You know. Um, uh, Eddie Van Halen. I mean, what can you say about Eddie Van Halen? I think uh, a piece of every one of us died a little bit when Eddie passed away. Um, I'm, I'm still it's bothered. Almost, by it, it. It, it's it's it, in a weird way. It's almost like a piece of Los Angeles died, mm. you know, when Eddie passed away because he was. Uh, I mean, he was such a uh, magnetic force. You know, I mean, it's one of the reasons. Like, wow, I'm, I'm moving to LA. Maybe I'll get to see Eddie Van Halen. Mm. You know, um, yeah, it's just. Uh, I mean. You, you can't measure it. It's just too big a loss for both of them. Some stories poured out after his passing. Um, and uh, one was that uh, early on in his, uh, in his grammar school and high school days, he was, uh, he was bullied significantly, from what I understand. I, I had read something of, of that as well, yeah. Being yeah. from a mixed family and from another country and not being able yeah. to speak the language initially. Yeah. I got a hard yeah. time for it, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, it, it, it's amazing how the music just transcended all that. Absolutely. You know? um, which is a huge thing, huge but thing, he, and, he, and, and a great lesson, right? And, and he's, he's got, you, you've seen him in interviews, I'm, you may even have been there, but that 5150 Studios got music in it. It certainly does, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I know Wolfgang is actually going on Howard Stern on Monday. Oh, great. Yeah, and uh, it's gonna de debut his new song to his dad, uh -huh. and uh, there, you know, so you never know where that band Van Halen goes. Yeah, uh, yeah, Eddie won't be here physically, but if we get to hear some of that music at some point, um, uh, oh, I'm sure we will. I mean, by yeah, all yeah. accounts, everything that uh, Wolfgang is doing, I I haven't heard any of the music, but I've heard that it's wonderful, and uh, you know, he's he's got the right genes. Yeah, and he played everything on it. Wow. Sang, wrote everything, drums, everything. So, you have any questions there, Tom? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in 1991, uh, you uh, moved on to other projects, uh, departing from White Lion, and uh, there was a few. You, I mean, you kept yourself quite busy over the years. I mean, you mentioned. I think you mentioned uh, about a movie, uh, but I'll we'll get to that uh, momentarily. I might have uh, misheard you on that, but some yeah. of the other projects. Uh, uh, You've done many over the years, but two in particular that you're still currently with uh, or wor have worked on recently, Legends of Classic Rock uh, and Rough Riot. Yes. Um, Legends of Classic Rock is a band I have with Terry Luce, um from XYZ. Uh, we do uh, corporate events and we do uh, private, private events and we do, uh, you know, whatever's going to, you know, those different kind of uh, venues that'll book us like casinos, uh, cruises, things like right. that. And uh, it's a great band. It's Terry, myself, Danny Johnson from Rod Stewart's band is on guitar. Sean McNabb from Dokken is uh, playing bass. And um, Kevin Jones from Ozzy Osbourne's band is playing keyboards. And wow. uh, it's a retrospective you know, uh, songs that we've all been a part of uh, in one way or another. And uh, it's a great time. You know, we uh, we have a good time playing with each other. Yeah, it sounds like it. Sounds yeah, like we, were, we were quite busy in uh, March of this year and with a very bright uh, outlook on uh, the c a couple of years to come. And uh, unfortunately, like everyone else, our plans kind of got squashed. Yeah, have you guys been holding up overall? Just uh, hunkering down, I'm sure. 
I get I mean, as a musician, maybe that's one uh, quality that uh, you kind of uh, get used to. You're bored as hell, but uh, you understand that you kind of have to roll through the punches. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what you're doing currently. So the now, obviously, we're still kind of in the unknown with the lockdown or whatever going on. And mm -hmm. um, uh, are you still playing with Steven? I know it said it ended in 2018, but is that because he went with Rat? you know back to the rat thing or is it something like where to, the even went back to rat i mean that's really the primary primary reason um and uh you know it just ran its course do you speak to uh, any of the uh former members of white lion uh yeah i speak to Vito, you know at least once or twice a year just to keep touch i speak with mike you know kind of along the same lines as well oh that's good it's always nice to you know keep in touch with the with everybody else. Anything that you want to promote? Um, no, really, other than that, I mean, I've been keeping busy doing drum tracks for a bunch of different people at my st my uh, studio, my house, you know, between um, the mid 90s and um, probably to like the, uh, you know, the mid 2000s, I owned a, um, a studio, a mix room in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, with a couple of really big consoles, and we hosted Michael Jackson, Madonna, and uh, wow. had a good business going for a very long time. Um, closed that studio in 2005, but kept the majority of a lot of the uh, of the um, gear that I acquired over the years, the Neve stuff and APIs and Neumanns, and those are you know kind of like uh, the names that the uh, Conoscente will be familiar with, and um, and uh, I just started playing drums more uh -huh. you know, and recording drums more. Lately, nope. notwithstanding with uh, recording over the web, uh, have you uh, done any uh, digital recording with colleagues uh, remotely? Yeah, sure. I mean, not at the same time. Usually when we do that kind of stuff, you know, we'll say, well, we're going to do this track. And uh, nine times out of 10, I'll be the first guy to play. I'll play to the record and uh, send it off to whoever's next. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, and uh, eventually I'll hear it. <laughs> yeah, right. It's gonna it's gonna make the rounds. Actually, yeah. I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, and this is another story that Mike and I haven't brought up. Uh, <laughs> Mike, remember the uh, the trailer park studio thing? Oh yeah. yeah. The, the, that was a hell of a night. Um, <laughs> oh my god. Tom, if you see that face, Tom has. Uh, um, I had yet to ever see it angry. <laughs> And yeah. who did I get a get a shot at that? He gave me the finger. He got so mad, and I didn't even do anything. We were hanging with a friend of ours, and uh, name will be nameless. Yeah, no names. We went up to. Uh, he's lived. Tom lives in Rockland, New, New York. Um, I'm in. Uh, was you I were still in, at that I time. down in like I was still in uh, like Parsippany or something. Right, you were in Parsippany. Our, our bass player, who I'm gonna bring bring up in a minute. Um, lived in like Liberty Hill. So we're all over the place. And um, our friend has a trailer and we go up there to all record in the trailer as a full band for now, a week. Against, first of all, nothing against trailers per se. All right? Oh, no, no. The trailer was fine. Or, this is what, and you didn't tell us like, you know, the studio, right, was in the trailer. But go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it was like a portable studio. We brought it to the trailer. You know, it was a great place by a lake in the Poconos. We were cool. Yeah. Um, we're hanging out and we're starting to record and then all of a sudden apparently uh, Phil Spector comes in after a few beers and decides we're making the wall of sound albums <laughs> and, you know <laughs> and so we just kind of like sit around start watching movies and we're drinking and stuff Tom yeah. has stuff to do because he only went up there for a night to, and we did get his drums down and he's uh, laying on the couch and this guy started jumping around like a monkey and yeah. It was, it was real bad when he put a, a slice of pizza on Tom's head. And I'm Tom, like passed out. I'm like, you know, trying to get a good night's sleep. So I, wa I went out to my car and I basically just lay, you know, went to sleep in the car. Mike comes up because he feels bad and he knocks on the window. And I just basically went to him like, just yeah. stay away from me, bro. <laughs> so it was like that. But the, the other part, Mike, that if I can mention this. The weird thing, and Greg, you can relate to this. When when you're laying down a, a, a track, usually the drums come first, you know, and then yeah. the bass and the guitar and then the vocals. That's, you know, standard. This guy's a guitarist, 
and he wanted to record the guitars first. <laughs> I've never, you know, and we're not talking about digital equipment. We're talking analog. There's no click track going on. Yeah, I've done that. I've done that a couple of times. Yeah. I've been given, yeah, I've been given guitar and just, you know, play to it. Um, you know, usually like in White Lion and really most of the bands when I'm, when I, when I, when we're playing live, the thing that I have loudest in my monitor is the guitar. Huh. Yeah. It's but just the, kind of, it's rock and roll. Rock and roll is yeah, a guitar did, band, you know? But did you have like a click track to the guitar player initially? Yeah, was the it? guitar player plays to a click. And so you can kind of feel where they're pushing and pulling. This and, is like uh, beer infused. Yeah. It wasn't you know, like professional. Just, the guy did a pass and he loves it and that's what he wants it to be. And so you make it fit. You figure yeah. it out. Yeah. Yeah, we, we worked it. Um, we and unfortunately he didn't play to a click track. We you know it was uh, and I felt that it was you know that would be standard and uh, it just unfortunately didn't occur. But it was, it was, it was very multiple yeah. rooms in the trailer, so it was like I was giving cues through a mirror to him for the parts of the songs that changed. That's fine. So yeah, <laughs> but we played together enough that we yeah. could have made it work, but it just went all over. Yeah. It, went, it went to what we call Shipville. Yeah, but uh, thing, man. You, you got a good story work. out of it. <laughs> make it work. Uh, so your website, you uh, have gregdangelo.com, and I think that brings you over to the Facebook page uh, to yes. connect with people. That's what, best way to get in touch with me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when you we get out of this and you have anything to promote or anything uh -huh. um, or shows, we'd like to maybe have you back on. I'd and, love to come uh, back on any Push that guys. stuff for you, you know, and then have a fo you know follow up conversation. Yeah, um, I would like to ask if it's not too much for a favor. Sure. All right, we have a friend. He's our bass player in the band. He was in that trailer with us. Okay. Don Woody Achenbach. We call him Woody. Woody. Yes, and he uh, just survived stage three tongue cancer. Oh my god. Where they took two thirds of his tongue and put a new tongue on his on from his leg on his tongue. Wow. And then had a mini heart attack and a mini stroke. Oh, no. But he's in great spirits, and he's this guy that you can't kill him, you know, you, he, which is a good thing. But he's like one of those people that will fight to like, like a big old bull. Okay. Basically, one of the things that I, that I was thinking we could do for him yeah. was just get some of the artists that, uh, because he's a huge music fan, obviously, uh -huh. get a few of the artists that we're, we're speaking with to just say, hey, Woody, you know, it's Greg D'Angelo, blah, 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 and, you know, give him a, you know, wish you well. Sure. And we'll put them together for him. Absolutely. That would be cool with you. So whenever you have a second there. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Hey, Woody, hang in there, man. Best of luck to you. You heal up and get back to playing. Thank you, Greg. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think he's going to like it. So, um, right. you know, anything to lift the spirits when somebody, when the colleague is down. Sure. So, um, yeah. So I think we uh, had a good time here. I enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. You know, if there's anything that comes up that because Tom is a web uh, runs a web design company, so what you're going to see is pictures and things inter you know interspersed that we'll give you to approve before okay. we post it. Sure. Um, if there's anything that comes in there that you want us to mention that popped in your head, just message me and I'll get it to Tom or message Tom. I'll leave the group open if you want until okay. the episode is done, and then if something comes up, um, and you have my email as well. Um, nice. I sent you an email message last night just telling you about the Zoom and stuff. Um, in case, yeah, just in case you didn't see your messenger. Um, okay. So if there's anything there that you need, um, just yeah, just pop in, let us know. And and uh, I'm real honored to, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the fun for me on this show is um, if somebody I looked up to as a you know as an up and coming musician and a young kid, and you're not even that far off in age to, than me, but. Um, but to be a peer and to have the opportunity to have a, a nice conversation, bullshit, and get to know you as a person, that's the, the valuable thing to me now. Thank you, guys. It's, a, it's been a pleasure, and I appreciate the kind words and um, look forward to seeing this. And if there's anything else you guys need further from me, yep. don't hesitate to ask. Sounds great. I mean, it's only – if we ever had to add in anything, it's, uh, Zoom is pretty quick and easy with that, yeah. right? So. That's right. It's all good. See, see, lips almost killed Tom because Tom's still editing the two hours. Oh boy! And <laughs> Just about done. Just about. Yeah, done. Uh, the time you see this uh, studio audience, uh, you'll uh, <laughs> the uh, other episode for uh, for lips from Anvil is out there. It's a, it's a heck of an interview. But you know what? Man. This was a great interview. 
And, uh, you know, Greg, I just want to thank you. And I had the chance to talk with you beforehand. And, uh, you know, if I dare say this for, for a rock drummer, you're a true gentleman. So uh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Right, right back at you guys. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So everyone, thank you for joining us for Rockland Sound. This is our fifth episode. You can catch us at rocklandsound.com. You can catch our Facebook page. Uh, and we'll be having some uh, very interesting guests that Mike is lining up over the next several weeks. So please tune thank in. You. And uh, we look forward to Greg connecting with you and all of the people that have been uh, kind enough to join us. So uh, I'm gonna, thanks again. I'm going to add a tag onto Tom's line in the beginning. So from rock to rockland to Austin to Austin. <laughs> keep you going. There it is. So okay. thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, again. See ya. All right. Have a good one, man. We appreciate it. Yeah. Great job. Thank you.